Saturday. Christmas comes early. Unbelievable! Welcome to this incredible scene. Bills. To the end zone! Chargers. It's a touchdown! An exclusive NFL game. This is fantastic! Live in primetime. Wow! Only on Peacock. With a Christmas gift to their fans. They're having some fun now. Bills versus Chargers. Saturday, 7.30 Eastern, exclusively on Peacock. Hey, Eagles fans, this is Chris Franklin from NJ Advanced Media, and welcome to the No Huddle Show podcast, the show where we discuss all things related to the Philadelphia Eagles. Before we begin, I want to remind you that you can read our content on nj.com slash eagles, and make sure to bookmark that to get the latest Eagles news and analysis. Today, once again, joined by my No Huddle Show co-host Bob Brookover and Caden Steele. We're going to talk about this three-game losing streak the Eagles somehow found themselves find themselves in. We'll also talk about the surprise move that the Eagles made in the defensive side of the ball, and we're going to talk about Jalen Hurts and what's going on with him. But first, I'm going to go to you to both Bob and Caden. Bob, how Caden? How are you guys doing? Doing great, Do- doing great. I'm sorry, Caden, I cut you off. Go ahead, Caden, you go first. <laughs> No, 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 no. Doing great. Uh, it's almost Christmas time, right? So we're all last second trying to, you know, get everything that we need for people, you know, in our lives. To, and that's the fun part of it. You know, two days left. It's, you know, it's been busy uh, with work, but also got a few days off this week. So that was nice. Uh, we kind of be able to relax, but we're getting right back in the thick of things with a Christmas game coming up. Oh, sure. Rub it in a couple of days off. Good, good, good for you. <laughs> me, me, I'm making eggnog and getting ready to go do Christmas carols tonight. <laughs> My my neighbors love it when I knock on their door and start singing. <laughs> anyway, I'm doing great. Uh oh, we've lost Chris. Oh, I'm sorry. It's good to hear. Here we go. Uh, sorry about that. I was, I was, I was, the problem. The problem was I was on mute so much because I was laughing my butt off. I was curse her. Excuse me. I was laughing my butt off because all I had was this image of Bob running around like to, like an elf hat, just yelling like "Tis the season to be jolly," and just run around up and down the street like, "Oh my gosh, is that Brookover guy again?" I don't know. <laughs> no, nope, nobody, but, uh, nobody follow laws like me. <laughs> All right, boys, we'll get into it right now. One thing I think that a lot of people would wish that Santa would give the Philadelphia area is a win. It's been a while now since we've seen one. It's been three straight losses now. Coming off the Eagles are coming off that Monday night loss, late the last second loss to the Seattle Seahawks 20-17, a game which they led pretty much throughout, and it looked like they dominated early and, and looked like it was going to be a completely different in a completely different way. And – I, leading up to that game, we 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 were all kind of scrambling. While I was on a plane, that was that was a lot of fun, and I appreciate you guys to take hold it down there. There's a lot of changes that going on, including fi- finding out that Matt Patricia had become the new defensive play caller. Sean Desai was moved up to the press box. This is now Matt Patricia's. It's his defense now. So I'm going to ask you guys first. I'll start with Bob, and then we'll go over you to, to you, Caden. Do you think that this Matt Patricia move to have him to def- as a defensive play caller was a panic move? Uh, yes. And I, I'll just go back to your, your, your little plane ride there. I, I had this lead all planned out all week to write for, uh, for, for the Monday of the game about, I talked to Jason Kelsey and somebody was talking to Jason Kelsey about Jason Peters, uh, his career. And he, he talked about, well, the last time he was here and how, how much he talked about since the time Jason Peters left the Eagles, how much, how much has changed since then, because it's just the NFL and things change. And, and that was like on Friday, I think. And the, the basis of my lead was going to be, um, you know, uh, by the time by the time I sat down to write it, so much has just changed just with the Eagles in that time period because Darius Slay had been ruled out and had surgery. Um, two other starters had been ruled out of that game. And then Sean Desai was no longer the defensive signal caller. He's the defense coordinator for, for whatever that title's worth these days. Uh, but it was insane. So, yes, I do think it was a panic move. I don't necessarily think it needed to be made um you know it obviously didn't save them on monday night uh you know and even even if it had it was one of those things where 
you know, there's the old thing about there's an old saying about firing baseball managers. Well, you better check who the, who's pitching the next day before you do it because you you want to you don't want the staff ace going the day you fire their manager. You want the, the number five guy going so you can at least get a win that first day and say, hey, look, it's already working. Uh, so and it, this reeked of that <laughs> somewhat because you know Drew Locke is uh, you know certainly not the, the, I, he hadn't won a game since 2020. Uh, so. You know, it it, it 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 was a move that. It, how much difference can you really make at this point? You know, you have the personnel that you have. The, the, the much worse move for the for the Eagles was that Darius Slay wasn't playing, uh, and that Zach Cunningham wasn't playing. That you were missing two of your starters. That was that had more to do with anything to me uh, than anything that Matt Patricia did, uh, all due respect to Matt Patricia, he, Patricia, he's, he's had a great career in a lot of ways as a defense coordinator. He's got Super Bowl rings to prove it. Uh, but you know, he wasn't going to change the Eagles defense in a week. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. What do you say? What do you think about Caden? Yeah, and I got to agree with Bob. It's definitely a panic move. You don't usually see teams, you know, at this point in the year, especially teams, you know, that were or maybe are still considered potential, you know, NFC contenders, switch defensive coordinators, you know, right up before week 15. It, it just – it seems like a move where they're – I don't think, you know, all of this was on the side. Um, at times, they, they must have felt – it just wasn't working overall with him. And, you know, I'm not in, in the building in those meetings. And um, maybe they felt Patricia's experience would help get the best, you know, use out of their personnel. But um, similar to what Bob said, it doesn't fix their personnel issues. We saw it on the last drive. And you, you can criticize what, you know, Patricia was calling, you know, not – you know, having a safety out there on that last touchdown or having a safety over the top to help um, James Bradbury uh, cover JSM on the game winner and stuff like that. But um, considering what this personnel is and what the, how the defense has struggled all year, it seems like a move where they didn't have, you know, answers on defense and they're just like hoping maybe changing something up, uh, you know, getting someone with a little more experience could, um, you know, stop the bleeding, but and at times in that game, you can you know, can argue through the first three, three and a half quarters, the defense played a lot better than it has in past weeks. But at the same time, it was against Drew Locke, a backup quarterback, and then you gave up a game game winning drive. So Matt Patricia, with his experience in Super Bowl rings, probably won't do enough to fix this defense, or because the personnel isn't suddenly going to get better. And with Slay out and cutting him out, it got worse, and then. Right now, you have you know a lot of issues on that back seven, and we'll we'll see what happens going forward. But it, it was definitely a panic move. They don't know you know how to fix it, and then they're giving it their best shot. And sometimes you have to change up things, uh, you know, for the sake of changing things up to hope it it works. But it just seems like a team that's just running out of options. See, I, I I go in a different way. I don't think it was so much a panic move. I believe it was something that's necessary done. It was almost something like what you used to see in like a, in like hockey. I know Bob mentioned baseball. In terms of hockey, when you have this talent that they have on that side of the ball, the names you have and the and the assets that you applied, especially along the defensive line, and, and when they're not is not working in conjunction with the secondary, you need to make a spark. And the easiest spark to make is changing the coach. I think Sean Desai. I thought he's. I think he's a bright mind. I think he still has another chance in the future to become a defensive coordinator and and, and clean his slate. But when I look at the way that he do, like what this defense does, it's something that had to be done. And I think this is a way to is a wake up call because to the players now, the fact that that you changed the defensive coordinator to a guy with the pedigree that Matt Patricia has. I know a lot of people say like, okay, well, you get to Detroit and they weren't as good. And then you look at what's the Patriots and we know about him being the offensive coordinator and all that stuff. I understand that. But when you look at what he's been able to do, you need to create a spark. And now it looked, they say, like, hey, look, we chase the coaches. If you guys aren't playing as well as you are right now, it's on you. And if it's on you, we're going to start making personnel changes. So I look at it in that terms just thinking, you know what, okay, I don't think it was a panic so much, but – Yes, yeah, it's, it's history. You got am I a little off, my way off base on that? Well, well, my my question to you would be this, Chris. I'm play the devil's advocate here a little bit. Who's the defensive star? Who who, who is it on that team? 
uh, Hassan Reddick and Josh Sweat. And the reason why I think we look at that. But you can, I'll go back to that in a second. I, 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 wouldn't, I would say, yes, those are, those are probably the closest to things you have to star. And like Jalen Carter is, and Jordan Davis had kind of emerged that. But we're, all ta- we're talking all pretty much about defensive linemen there. Uh, and how much does the coordinator really affect the defensive linemen? I mean, they're, you know, they're going to run stunts and they're going to run, you know, but they're rushing the passer, they're run, rushing the passer or playing the edge. Uh, and I, I'm, I might argue that uh, neither Reddick or Sweat is a great edge setter. Uh, they're they're great pass rushers when when things are going right and and the scheme is going right. But uh, you know, I I just think. When you when you're talking about a defense coordinator, you're talking about wh- how they're coordinating the back seven more than m- more than the front four. See, I was looking at the reason why I use that is there were so many times, and, and I know they used it here and there once on Monday night, but there were so many times when in third and long situations where you saw Reddick having to drop into coverage or in a flat or, or somewhere, or you saw Josh Sweat dropping into the flat or, or back into coverage, you're like. Wait a minute. Let your let let them cook. Let you, let your def- edge rushers cook. Well, let, let them do what they were paid to do, and, and and have a lot of success. And I look at the way they're trying to do with some of these stunts. You're like, okay, you want to attack this certain area of the offensive line, and then you look at it, and then you think the coverage would be able to give them some time the way they scheme the coverage. But it's like, all right, here's a cover four. Here, here's cover three and it's on third and two, or we'll drop these guys back there too. And oh yeah, and you know offenses are trying to get the ball out quick. That's what I'm like. You know what? Yeah, let's give him a little spark and, and and change some stuff up. I, I don't know. If, I don't know. If maybe that's what I was looking at. Yeah, no, I, that, that, that's a, that's a that's a great point. I mean, you don't have to sack the quarterback. Obviously, everybody knows that to to affect the quarterback. I think that it comes to mind. I it was one of the Eagles three and out series that Lane Johnson basically got pushed back by uh, I think it was Boy Mafi um, on a. And, and he, you know, he just put his hand up. He was in his face already and put his hand up and and bat it down the pass. I mean, so that's just as – it's not just as good as a sack, but it's, you know, it's just as good as a no-game run. So, um, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it's um, you know, a, a matter of – I agree with you on – I would always have four pass rushers. And, uh, and when the game was – it down to the last drive of the game, I would I would have five or six pass rushers more often than that. I'd rather pressure, especially a guy like Drew Luck. I'd rather pressure him into mistakes, and he made some. I mean, if you go back and look at the drive, he made some mistakes. Uh, it was a horrible drive for James Bradbury. He had a he had a horrible day on one drive. Um, and <laughs> he, he had you know he had a chance for an interception there. The, the ball that. Um, Metcalf caught off his leg. Uh, he should have intercepted that ball. I mean, and there were other chances. Balls going in the air. They had so many chances to to, to, to win that game and, and didn't. Yeah, they did. They really, they really did. And when you look at the way I, when, I, when I look at this now, I, I think it leads up to our, our our next the next thing I want to ask you guys was this? I mean, Sean Desai only lasted this long. Was this more on him, or was this more on the personnel that he was working with? And if so, if it's more personnel, does Howie Roseman deserve the extra blame? I'll go to you first game. Yeah, and uh, I think you know some of this blame definitely needs to be on the side um, throughout the year. Uh, he didn't do the best job of putting his personnel in the best positions to succeed. But the the defensive personnel isn't that good. You look you look at the starters on this defense and even the depth, you know, going forward, there's only two guys on this team, two young guys in my opinion, that you could definitely define as, you know, core long term pieces. Like on the, I'm, and I'm talking guys who are under, you know, three, four years, and it's Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter. For the rest of the defense, uh There isn't like a ton of, you know, young, you know, young guys that you can really, you know, hope for in the future that can continue building this thing. And I don't think they've built this defense, you know, well from that perspective. Um, They haven't invested enough in the back seven. Um, I think any time and this is where the blame could go, you know, to Hallie Roseman that you're relying on two corners, you know, over, you know, the age of 30. It is problematic. And uh, for Slay. He's still playing well, you know, throughout this year. Missed last game with, you know, after going undergoing knee surgery. And hopefully, you know, for them, they get him back because he's still their best corner. But on the other side, James Bradbury has really, really, really struggled this year. And we saw it on the last drive. Um, Seattle just picked on him 
uh, the entire drive. And James Bradbury is the, you know, ultimate, you know, uh, professional. He's a good guy. You know, all of those things you could you could say about him. But um, some things happened this year and uh, it looks like he's lost a step and maybe it was already happening, you know, last year and we just didn't see it. And maybe Jonathan Gannon did a better job of covering it up. Uh, with better safety play with Chauncey Gardner Johnson, uh, you know, being able to roam back there, maybe this was already something in, in the works. But you gave him a three-year, thirty-eight million dollar contract, Harry Roseman, and it, it's not working. You lost both of your safeties. And uh, uh, I, my personal, you know, perspective is if you're trying to, you know, as a defense, especially in the back seven, um, you're and you go into the year and. Um, you have to sign Zach Cunningham to be a starter in August. And then you, when you got to make a trade in October to get a safety, it just seems like this defense, you know, already coming into the year was lacking town. There seemed to be no answers. You lost, you know, four, key, five key defensive, you know, starters in free agency, Javon Hargrave, TJ Edwards, Kaiser White, um, uh, Marcus Epson, Johnson Gardner Johnson. So you already lost a ton of defensive personnel and, we're already and you talk about the defensive line and not getting pressure. Uh, you know, Jalen Carter and Jordan Davis, you know, have been great through most of this year, and they are these core young pieces. Uh, but they've also, you know, they've kind of quieted down over the last few, you know, few weeks. Jalen Carter flashed, you know, against Seattle, but overall, just um, you know, you're going to hit a rookie wall sometimes. And Jordan Davis didn't play a ton of games last year, so that might be a part of it as well. And you don't have a guy like Javon Hargrave anymore. So defensive personnel wise, and High Roseman. Uh, didn't do the best of job of replacing some of those core pieces, you know, in the off season, he thought, you know, Kobe Dean would stay healthy and take that next step. We don't know what he is right now because of injuries and uh, sign Nicholas Morrow and sign Zach Cunningham and uh, traded for Kevin Byard. Who's not the same player he used to be added Shaq Leonard, hoping it would be a, you know, a last second fix as well at the linebacker position. It's just this defensive personnel is not good enough at this point at corner, at safety, at linebacker. And the defensive line isn't producing the same way um, that it used to. So you were not able to cover up some of those same issues in the past. So, yes, Sean Desai, you know, deserves some of the blame because um, it, it just seems like he didn't know how to maximize, you know, s- some of those players and also just – find a solution for even when, you know, the defensive personnel, you can't be strong at every single spot. So you're going to be able to, you know, get your guys produced um, you know, to the best of their abilities. And I don't think he was doing that. So maybe Matt Patricia can do more with less, you know, per se, but this defensive personnel is, you know, just so weak on the back seven where, you know, four weeks of, you know, Matt Patricia, suddenly is it going to fix everything? It might get slightly better, but in those late-game situations, um, like we saw, uh, teams are going to be confident they could pick on James Bradbury and all these other players that they have back there. And uh, just unless they can turn a corner, um, it's probably going to be the thing that ultimately, you know, ends up leading to why they didn't get to their, you know, back to the NFC Championship or Super Bowl this year. And, uh, you know, other um, – the kind of differently than offense, you know, offense, you know, you think, um, you know, some people are out there and you're questioning why Brian Johnson, you know, isn't fired and stuff like that. And, and I mean, it's fair in the sense that the offense, it hasn't produced a ton, but at the same time, at least, you know, they have, you know, the core pieces that you feel like they could figure it out with Jalen Hurts and AJ Brown, Devonta Smith, and Dallas Cotter on defense. Um, you know, the guys who are supposed to be those, you know, standout players from a different personnel perspective, Hassan Reddick and Josh Watt and Fletcher Cox. And even those guys, you know, aren't having, you know, the best of seasons necessarily. They've produced and flashed at times and gotten to the quarterback, but it hasn't been consistent. So your top guys aren't producing the way they are. The defensive personnel, you know, the depth isn't that good. You're throwing in because of injuries, you're throwing out guys like Keely Ringo, Eli Ricks, and Sidney Brown and Bradley Roby and all these different. There's been no consistency on the back seven throughout the year because of injuries. Avanti Max gets activated from the 21 day practice window. So you hope that maybe that affects things, but no consistency in the back end and just um, just just players aren't producing. The personnel isn't that good. So I think it's defensive personnel. All right, cool. Bob, what do you think? 
Yeah, I, I would agree with that. It goes back to my question I asked you a few minutes ago. Who's the star? Uh, you know, Darius Slay has been a star in this league, but he hasn't been a star this season. Uh, you know, he's what's what's he what's he got this season? One interception. Two, two interceptions this season. Uh, that's not Darius Slay. He's not, you know, he wasn't playing at a star level. He was playing, he was, he, he was playing, I think, better than the criticism he was getting. Uh, it, you know, people were, you know, talking about him, his tackling and stuff. Well, you know, I, I, I watched and so did you, Chris, I'm sure. Deion Sanders played a whole NFL career where he wasn't much of a tackler, but you wanted him on the field for your side because you weren't going to throw at him. Um, now, I'm not saying that Darius Slay was Deion Sanders this year. He wasn't. Uh, I'm actually saying he hasn't even been Darius Slay this year, uh, the, the guy who can dominate a game. Um you know that it, it, yeah, there's just there's there's no defensive stars, and in recent weeks, um, you know, even Jalen Carter and Jordan Davis, the two guys that came to alluded to, had not played at the same level they had been. Uh, you know, the, the the Eagles got a little bit better at stopping the run last week, but you know, there were a lot of times where where Kenneth Walker was getting some broke off some big runs against him. Uh, yeah, I think it's more of a, a personnel problem too. Uh, Caden covered a, a lot of it, um, but I I do think it's more personnel than the coordinator. I you know I, I'm a, I'm the type of guy who always tends to think it's more on the players than the than the coaches. I you know it's the Jimmys and Joes not the X's and O's. Uh, and, and I do do without going over every position, I really do think it's more per- personnel than, uh, and, you know, that's not, that's not to say, and, and it better not be the case for the Eagles because, you know, Bradbury and Bradbury and Slayer tied up through 2025 pretty much uh, unless they want to take some serious cap hits. Um, uh, you know, Bradbury's cap hit is what for next year it's seventeen million. The year after that it's twelve million. Uh, so it's not going to be easy to just say, "Hey, James, see you later." Um, obviously, the cap's going to go up some, but you know, they, it's some of these guys can come back and have better years. Uh, Reddick's had a pretty good year, but just not the year he had last year. Same with Sweat. Um, you know, you you need you need uh, these guys to come back and rebound. And maybe if it is the if it is the coordinator, well, then we should maybe not this season, but see it next season. Um, you know, and and obviously the hope would be that they see it this season because they don't want to give up on a season that started ten and one. But if we don't see it by next season, then you got to really question question the personnel. See, I'm looking at the personnel, and I'm looking like, all right, cool. I, I think the only th- part I, I question right now, like at least for the future, is really the linebacker spot. And I, I'm, and I don't know about you guys, I'm kind of dreading this next off season because Trotz, uh, Jeremiah Trotter's son is eligible for the draft, and I'm just waiting for the. Well, we gotta bring Jeremiah Trotter back, son. You gotta bring him back home. You gotta bring him back home. Uh, hold off, guys. <laughs> just at least for now, just for a little bit. But I look at, it, I think it's just more. If, if you just get somewhat of a more if you had a somewhat of a more uh, competent no i'll I'll stick with that competent plan and a couple of these games i think that you see uh, a a different outcome the fact that you gave up so many uh so so many points to the buffalo bills oh to me i know you have josh allen but besides stefan diggs you have gabe davis there it's not that much that I really fear about that that offense the 49ers okay you can make a point that they could have they could have put up Probably about twenty four to twenty eight points. It should not have never been that. It should have never been that far away, even with those weapons, because we've seen what this 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 personnel can do. It's not that much different from what we've seen. Is it, 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 to me, at least anyway. I know you all CJ Gardner Johnson and, and Marcus Epps, but I think Reed Blankenship is a competent replacement, at least for Marcus Epps. You don't. It, it, this, this defense is not that much different. So. I look at you see a lot of those pieces that are back there, pieces that had success, pieces that were able to get 70 sacks, pieces that were able to get off the field on third downs. And that's the key things. You can't get off the field on third downs. I look a lot. That's where I look to, 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 to the play sheet and the person holding it. So that's why I'm like, all right, you know what? I'm going to side on the side. I place this on a little bit more on the side when it comes to that. But 
Uh, no, no, we're we're about to find out. <laughs> although, <laughs> For sure. Although, how much do we really find out in the next three weeks? But we can get to that later, you know, with the Giants. The, the Cardinals are an offense, a decent offensive team, uh, can be a decent offensive team. But the, the Giants... We'll get to we'll get to that when we get to predictions. Yeah, so. I think I think it's one of those days where I think it could be the scores could be so out of whack at times that you know we might have a shot to sign up and we might be elevated from practice signing to the practice squad to elevate. But that's a whole other story for another day. Uh, next, we're gonna look. At, we talked a lot about the defense. Let's go look over at the offense right now. And actually, I'll make this a two parter. First off, we talked when Nick Sirianni was on the uh, was on he took uh, on uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. Excuse me, get my days mixed up because it's, it's a weird week. But when Nick Sirianni, uh, no, it was Tuesday. Yeah, Nick Sirianni talked about the uh, offense, and he looked at it, he took full responsibility. He said Brian, offensive coordinator Brian Johnson, was getting way too much of the blame in terms of the offensive issues that they have had. Jalen, quarterback Jalen Hurts is not throw a touchdown pass in the last two weeks, and against that Seattle's defense, which was struggling a lot. They all, they only got put up 17 points. So I'll ask you, uh, uh, and I'll, first I'll ask you, I'll ask Bob you this question. Is what's going to take to get Jalen Hurts to be an MVP candidate again, or have we seen the best of him this season? Well, I don't think he's got any chance at the MVP candidacy. <laughs> and for, for the reason I just mentioned, the next three teams they play, nobody's going to say, oh, Jalen Hurts is back no matter how, they, how the Eagles play. Although, I will say this about the Giants having covered them. Uh, you know, they can be at times a very good defensive team, although right now Dexter Lawrence is not really healthy, and that's going to be a problem for them. Uh, the, the, I, I like the Giants linebackers a lot, uh, but, they, you know, they, they're just there are times when they're a good defense, but I don't know that we're going to see anything from Jalen Hurts going to make say, oh, yes, he should be the MVP candidate, even if they – run the table here and finish 13 and four, which, which just to think about for a second, if any, if we told anybody that the Eagles will give you 13 and four, when the season starts, uh, I think you would have had a lot of happy people actually, but, 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 that, but back to your question, I, I, I think, well, will we see Jalen Hurts be good again this season? Yeah, I, I do. I think we saw Jalen Hurts be good at a lot of times on, on Monday night against the, the Seahawks. Like I, you know, I went back and watched, that game uh series by series offensively and you know the, the the first two series of that drive i mean the first two series uh they scored on he he kind of saved them from their from mistakes from you know and situations where they're in third and long and he'd make he made throws uh he made runs the the offense was pretty balanced because they were they were getting the ball to gain well and and uh even more so to Swift, uh, you know. So there were times. The, the only time I didn't think Jalen Hurts really looked good in that game was uh, during the. He had two drives at the end of the first half, a two minute drill, uh, particularly the first one because he only had twenty eight seconds the second time, and then the two minute, you know, the even even the two minute drill um, at, at the end end of the game, he could have made some decisions that got them into field goal range. Uh, I still think he's a really good quarterback. I had a long talk yesterday with Marcus Mariota about, you know, the, the big thing going around right now, and both Jordan Malata and 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 uh, Marcus Mariota, the big thing going around right now is, oh, Jalen doesn't, you know, he's not in their faces on the sideline, and, uh, you know, he's not he's not looking at the – looking at the sheets or the, the uh, tablets during when the offense is off the field. And he's not doing, he, he's doing as Jordan Malata said, it, Oh, when he was, when we were winning, he was even keel and he wasn't getting too high. And now he doesn't care. Uh, you know, Cause that's just not true. Um, and Mario the, the most interesting thing Mario said to me about jail. And I thought was, I said, Hey, is it, is it your role to just, trying to keep him up and give him positive feedback is no, that's not what, that's not what Jalen Hurts is all about. He said, he's about, he wants to know how can I get better? He wants me to tell him the truth. You know, I saw this and he said, oh, I, or I saw that. He doesn't want me telling him, Oh, you're, you're, you're great. Everything's great. Um, so, you know, it's, I think Jalen Hurts, is, his head's in the right place. 
uh, you know, he, everybody wanted to minimize, well, he was able to play. And that, that to me, maybe was the most concerning quote, quote of the, the week was from, uh, AJ Brown. Was, well, he's sick. He, it doesn't matter. He's sick. He played. If you play, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, he was sick, you know, <laughs> he wasn't feeling good, but uh, to, to answer your question, I think, I think we're still going to see a good Jalen Hurts, uh, for the remainder of this season. Cool, cool. And Kate, I'm going to ask this to you. Do you think that the offense has been too predictable? Yeah, I, I think it has. And you go back to, you know, what they did last year, and they had so much success with Shane Steichen. And, you know, for for most of this year, uh, it feels like Brian Johnson has been trying to replicate some of those thing, same things. And to me, it just hasn't evolved enough. And that's, what, you know, what great offenses are in the they still have the pieces uh, to figure this thing out before the end of the year. But this offense uh, through 15 weeks, it's there's just been, you know, no consistency. And, uh, and uh, you know, they don't run a ton of motion. They don't do a lot of things, you know, to set up their playmakers, something that we talked about, you know, last week and that, you know, continues uh, to be an issue. And, and the, in the offense, you know, it just seems there is, you know, no identity, you know, at this point in the year, there, there is too much, you know, predictability of the stuff, you know, that they're going to try to run and, and what they try to do. And, you know, the big play hunt, um, they go for big plays and right now, you know, it's not working as well. They, you know, they take some of those shots and it seems like they're reliant on them and they don't set up a lot of easy stuff. You know, the first drive was really impressive, you know, against Seattle. And I thought, you know, it's, uh, you know, going for the rest of this game, maybe they, you know, they found some rhythm and it was going to continue throughout, you know, the rest of that game. But the offense continued to stall besides one more really good drive, you know, there in that, you know, in the, in the beginning of the second half. So, yeah, I think it, right now the offense is predictable. They don't have any solutions right now. They're not very explosive. Um, it's just it's just not working. And uh, somehow they need to evolve, you know, what they're doing, whether that's running more motion, whether that's. It, it, they have to find something because right now it's, they're trying to do what they did last year. And, you know, I read some, you know, some good articles, you know, on this this week and just people, you know, who are breaking down film and just noting this offense, just, you know, it's almost like a lot. I think I read an article in the athletic today and someone broke down, you know, film of the Eagles offense and they were just talking about, you know, how watered down, you know, the offense looks. And I think that, you know, that is true because, you know, trying some of those same concepts over and over and over again from last year. But defenses have evolved. They have adjusted and it's not working. And, you know, some of that might be, you know, your quarterback isn't as healthy this year and you're not able to effectively, you know, run the ball as much or, you know, some of those RPOs and things like that. And, and they they got to fix things because uh, it is a little stale. It is a little predictable, and it is worrisome. You know that you know you have all this talent. The offensive line, you know, hasn't gotten worse really. Cam Jurgens who replaces Isaac Kamalahu. That's you know that's that was like the biggest change you have. You still have AJ Brown, Devontae Smith, Dallas Goddard, make an upgrade at running back, but it just it just seems like the scheme is not getting the best of their talents, and it's too reliant on you know big plays, and um, and they're not getting them. To be honest, the explosive plays. It, it's just not working and they got to find a solution. All right, boys, we're at a two minute warning right now. We've got a, uh, we've got one timeout left. Uh, we're looking right now. We're going to get into this uh, giants predictions and also our, our, our outlook, what we see in this game. So what we're going to do is we got two minutes right now to go ahead and get what we think, uh, what we think about this. I'm going to start with the, uh, we're going to go to, we're going to try to get a first down here. We'll start with Bob. Bob, what do you think about this giants team? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a little bit of an expert on the Giants because I covered them for a half a season uh, before I made the move over here. Um, yeah, th- th- this Giants team's a mess. Uh, they had a they had a good three week Tommy Cutlets uh, thing going. He wasn't that great off, he, off during that. He was okay. He was pretty good, but you know it was against bad teams. Uh, the Giants are a bad team. The Eagles are going to win this game. I think I picked it 27 to 10, something like that. I forget what my exact pick was for the for the website, but something I I picked the Eagles to win by double digits and they they will win this game by double digits. Perfect. Kate, what do you think about when you look at predictions and and also what do you think about this game? Yeah, uh um, Eagles fans, you know, a lot, you know, a lot, people who are listening to this podcast are probably panicking after 
that you know three game losing streak and rightfully so i mean it's been rough but this is the perfect opportunity you know to get right especially starting on christmas against the giants you play them again later as well this giants team i know there was some hope out there uh, you know that they would make the playoffs after going on that winning streak with tommy devito and tommy devito like bob said you know played decent but he wasn't overly great and then they played a really good defense in the saints last week and you saw what happened they still have a ton of offensive issues. The offensive line still isn't very good. The wide receivers aren't very good. Just overall, the offense isn't very good. So for Matt Patricia, this might be the perfect game to kind of you know, continue fixing, you know, if you can fix the defensive personnel issues, if you can get your guys, uh, you know, playing well. And, you know, especially for the pass rush, this could be the game they get ramped back up. Guys like Kassan Reddick and Josh Wett, I expect them, to, you know, to have big days. And then offensively, uh, you know, this is this is a really important game for Jalen Hurts, you know, to rebound. Uh, you, and you got to hope that, you know, they they find ways to, you know, to pick apart this Giants defense. And outside of, you know, Kayvon Thibodeau and, um, you know, some of those guys on the D-line, not a very good defense either. The Eagles, from a talent perspective, should dominate this game, and they will. Uh, Eagles, you know, I, I think they're going to snap the, the streak and they're going to win 28 28- 14. All right, cool. I'm going to use our time out right now because I have an interesting little uh, question I want to ask you guys about this. Who has the greater yards? Does Saquon Barkley have more uh, total yards rushing and receiving, or does A.J. Brown finish with more receiving yards? Uh, well, what are they at right now? <laughs> I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, for the game, for, for, oh, for the oh, upcoming just, game. J- just, just for just the-, the game itself. Yep, just for the game itself. Uh, I, I'll say Saquon because he's going to have a lot more touches, and Saquon is still stuck. I mean, I, uh, you know, I watched him play for. He didn't have a good game against the, the Saints the other day. He had a horrible game, but he, he's still stuck. He's still in the, the. He missed however many games it was. Once he played one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten. He's played eleven games this year. He's still in the leaders in yards from scrimmage. Um, you know, he's had five games over 107 games over 90 he's still a stud that, that's an easy one Saquon Barkley <laughs> what do you think Aiden yeah uh and I think you know Saquon is a really you know good pick I, I think it's gonna be AJ uh, AJ Brown uh, is a super talented wide receiver and we talk about the offensive issues Remember that, you know, stretch earlier where he goes over 125, I think it was, you know, six consecutive times he might have broke. Yeah, six consecutive times he broke the NFL record. Since then, he's got 100 yards one time against San Francisco. He went for 114. For the Eagles, and I'm not saying this is going to fix their offensive, you know, schematic issues and how predictable they are in a sense, but they need to get A.J. Brown going if they want to, you know, start putting up points on offense and not – not score below 20, right? And I, I, uh, Brian Johnson and Nick Sirianni will find ways to get him involved. And, you know, the Giants secondary with uh, you know, Deontay Banks and Dory Jackson and Xavier McKinney, it's not a bad, you know, bad secondary at all. But there are points where there's going to be some matchups in this game where A.J. Brown can take advantage. And I feel like, you know, it's a necessity to do it at this point. So I, I think he's going to go over 100 in this game, and I'm not sure if Saquon will. All right, cool, cool. I, when I look at this game as a whole, I look at it as a as, I think this is a get right game for the Eagles. And even if it's not a get right game in the sense that they're going to, it's going to be a complete blowout, I look at it more in the sense that I think we'll see this defense play a lot better and they're able to play a little stout now. Kind of helps that Tommy DeVito's under as is the quarterback. So instead of Daniel Jones, because for some whatever reason Daniel Jones seems to play well against the Eagles, especially when he comes to running the ball, rushing the ball. But I look at it as a way that I think the Eagles are able to contain him. I look for this offense to be able to move the ball efficiently. I am a little worried about the uh, Sua Peta having Sua Peta, uh, uh, Landon Dickerson out and Sua Peta had to fill in, especially in the fact that the, how much the Giants like to blitz and Wake Martindale loves to send extra pressure just because I think he just loves to send it sometimes. But I think it also can help you out if you get rec- if Jalen Hurts recognizes where to the pressure comes from and gets it out early. I think this offense can get back on there, and I think he can have a 250, 260 yard passing day, and while throwing a couple of rushing touchdowns and a, and a passing touchdown. So I look for the Eagles to win this game. Uh, I think they say like twenty four to sixteen or something like that. But yeah, I think they get one step closer to clinching at the NFC East. But uh, guys, 
I have to say it. Thank you guys very much. This is the final uh, podcast we're going to have until uh, for Christmas. So for you guys, I want to say Merry Christmas to you all, to you guys, for everybody else that's out there. Happy holidays. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. And I just want to remind you guys also too. make sure to keep keep close to NJ.com slash Eagles. We're going to have a lot of stories coming up about this game. What's next? And uh, and especially upcoming with the dreaded rematch against uh, Jonathan Gannon coming back next week, which should be pretty interesting as well, too. So for Caden and Bob, I'm Chris. Everybody have a good holiday. Wait, wait, wait. wait. La la Uh la la. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) Keep that in your dreams, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) See you guys later. Have a good one now.